It is Session Stories. We are back for a, another episode. Uh, I'm so pumped to do this, and I'm, I'm going to brag about my guest today for a couple reasons, and I'm going to tell him why I'm really glad we did this closer to episode number 10 than one, and that's because, uh, you know, I have Tim Pierce here, and I, I could go on for hours about uh, how much Tim has inspired me and other guitarists and his session credits. If I read them all, I think we might be here for longer than the interview is. Um, but I, I have to, I'm, the reason I'm glad I waited is because everybody I've talked to with, I think maybe the exception of only one or two has brought up Tim's name. And what I think is neat about that is that it's been about Tim helping them or whether I spoke with Cliff Jones about Tim helping him have the idea of, hey, I found some space if you want to do a store, which I thought was cool. Or talking to RJ, Ron Kilio about how when he came out to Los Angeles looking to figure out what was next for his career after the Ricky Martin tour, he brought up that he met Tim being over at a studio doing some work and how Tim really helped guide him and help him not just on music, but on even like YouTube and that parallel. And I was interviewing Rich Rankin at James Tyler Guitars, I believe was episode number two. And Rich leans over and goes, hey, do you like my Tim Pierce shirt? And I was like, what I love about this is that as much of an impact as Tim has had on me and other guitarists as a guitar player, as a guitar teacher, uh, as somebody who I've told Tim was like, the rhythm parts and the lead parts that he has played are part of this long soundtrack of my life and why I picked up a guitar. But even more importantly, Tim doesn't know I'm going to tell him this story. Uh, I put the guitar down for, I want to say maybe two or three years. Life happens, right? You know, you have kids, a job, I'm trying to make things work. And it was during that shutdown that we were all in. And I'll never forget <laughs> the YouTube algorithm related links, how it leads you somewhere. I was watching a Songbirds Foundation video on Robin Ford. And the the YouTube thumbnail read, the Telecaster was the ugliest guitar I had ever seen. And that was a Robin Ford quote. But then he had talked about how he fell in love with it, etc. I loved the video. It was when I was picking the guitar back up. At the end of the video was a related link to a Tim Pierce video. Now, don't quote me on this, Tim, but it was either the Joe Cocker live stream or it was one that you talked about, this is the secret to all my solos, but it was one of your live streams and it was at the end of this video. And I watched it and I dove in and as I was reteaching myself, this 30 year guitar player on how to play again, I had seen all these videos and what I told Mark Diglio of XYZ, and I'll, I'll put this clip in here so there's proof, but I said, I think Tim Pierce is the best teacher on the planet right now <laughs> because, I, because I think there's so much noise out there um, and there's a lot of kids that have come to me through my channel and asked, how did you learn? How did you learn? Did you take a lot of theory? Did you not do a lot of theory? And I said, what I appreciated most about what Tim is doing with his lessons, because I dove into him to help me try to teach some kids recently, is that he made the complicated sound simple and he wiped away some of the noise from what I really need to know to play what it is I want to play, which brings me to my favorite video of all time, which he did called the modes that matter. And we can get into all that. But. I had to start the, the whole thing off. I wanted to tell Tim that because uh, I've been following him and watching him and his Saturday live streams are my favorite. I clear my schedule. I'm like, if Tim's going on at 1 p.m. Central, 11 a.m. his time, everybody can just wait because I want to see the live <clears> version. <throat> I don't want him. To, I don't want to see it when he edits it, you know, and uh, so I am so honored. I am so absolutely humbled to have Tim Pierce on Session Stories. Tim. Sorry for the long-winded intro, but thank you for joining, man. Uh, I enjoyed your intro, and I, too, have become a fan of your channel. You're doing something very important and very unique and bringing to light some really important parts of the recording industry and the legacy and the history of that, which I thankfully showed up in L.A. in 1979, and I got to actually witness some of this firsthand. And what I want to talk to you about which is what we talked about the other day, is I want to talk about being in the room with some of my heroes that are the same heroes as you, even though I'm quite a bit older. I, I got to actually be in the room with some of these guys. And as I was thinking about this interview, I thought this is going to be amazing to talk about 
these they're legends but they're these guys you know like Lukather, huff landau uh bukovac they're all they're all even better than you think and there are reasons for that and when you sit next to them you quickly discover these percentage points that are above the 95 percent that they live in you know they live in this 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 place that's right up near the tippy top of skill stamina instinct uh speed uh talent i mean it's and and i got better every time i worked with one of those people and i got better forever after working with every one of these people so we can talk about that but yeah i i love your channel and i love the one thing i also realized since we last talked was this stereo delay thing that is part of of what you bring to people and what you what you talk about i actually still use it every day and every hour <laughs> i disguise it the only thing that i don't use that's from that era is the chorus but mm. my delays are chorused <laughs> they're darkened <laughs> and they disappear so you don't always know they're there but they're there they're there all the time <laughs> So that was and that so, was a great discovery after we talked the other day. I thought, oh, I still actually Michael Thompson was the one who showed me the modulated stereo micro pitch in his H three thousand, and and I was off to the races. But anyway, ba uh, both back it. in your court. Uh, <laughs> I'm excited to talk about all this stuff. I love it. How? Let me start here. I think you and I. One of the things we started on was. Uh, I started playing the piano when I was four and I did get theory training through a Yamaha school of music that they were trying out in North Texas in the early eighties. And, but I quickly went to guitar and I tell people this all the time. When I started guitar, it was a hundred percent by ear. Yamaha was very big at that time about teaching by ear and then theory. I still see theory on black and white keys. And so a lot of what I value about what you teach Tim is the fact that you help a lot of us that didn't learn theory on the guitar. And what I find so interesting is when I talk to John McCurry and Mark Diglio and Dan Huff and so on and so on and so forth is I get a lot of the same thing. It was a lot of ear. It wasn't, we weren't instructed. I didn't have a whole lot of theory. I didn't know what the, if I was playing the Dorian mode, I just knew it fit right there. And that's what worked. You and I talked about how that has maybe more common than people think of the greats that you played with. Not everybody, but talk about your beginning. When did you first hear music? When did you pick up a guitar? What was your training like? Was it by ear? I guess um, I'm so interested in, in how your path began. Well, I'll move you through my uh, first 20 years super quick. Um, okay. I was born in 1958 and really by the age of three, I started to fall in love with Top 40 Radio, which was a magical place because it was eclectic. There was no real category or format. You could, you know, soul, folk, uh, country, R&B, rockabilly, then the emergence of rock. Everything was being thrown at you via Top 40 Radio. And then when the Beatles arrived, that was magical. So by the age of five, we're talking 1963, I, every time a certain song would come on that I liked, I'd be walking on air. And that's a, as a five-year-old. So my family were not musicians, but I fell in love with the songs on the radio. And that never ended. And then you, you move forward to the late 60s when I'm... See, I, I turned 10 in 1968. You know, I fell in love with Hendrix, uh, Clapton, Billy Gibbons, Johnny Winter, and everything else, Mark Farner, Grand Funk. There was nobody that was not the coolest thing in the world, not the coolest guitar player in the world. I loved all of it. So my love of music comes more from songs than from guitar. And just like you, the way guitar functions in a song is the most magical thing in the world to me. Okay, so you know I love the guitar stand up. You know Stevie Ray Vaughan, Jimi Hendrix. Hendrix was my main influence, like many of my age, but. Uh, I also was even more enamored with the way guitar players would fit parts into songs. You know, Steely Dan was the, you know, the epitome of that for me. So I, I played in bands and played in bands and I started to play in bar bands after I graduated from high school. And I really couldn't stick with my college schedule because I was playing late at night, missing classes in the morning. My parents got fed up and I thought, you know, let me just try moving to LA. So I, my mom gave me her old car 
And I had a little money saved and I moved to LA at the end of 1979. And LA at that point was all analog. So there were there was no way to make music unless you were making it with another person in a room somewhere. Uh, so that was the great thing about it is it was easy to connect with people because you had to connect with people in order to make music. You had to have a drummer and a bass player. You had to have a showcase. You had to have a rehearsal, a rehearsal room, a studio. There were tons of demos being done. There were tons of, uh, you know, people playing together all the time. So in a sense, it was a lucky place to land at that point. And it actually, in, in retrospect, it was not expensive. So it was easy to land and get set up. And I realized at a certain point, a few months in, that I was able to start buying gear and keep a bank balance of $700. I don't know why I remember that, but I think I bought my That's... Mesa Boogie Mark II with the the wicker grill and the wood, you know, the beautiful wood finish. And I was still able to keep 700 in my bank account, which meant that I was confident that I'd be able to meet my bills. But I did a lot of $30 rehearsals, $50 gigs, $50 sessions. And then by the age of 23, I got a few very big gigs a John Waite record in New York City, uh, a record here with Jonathan Cain's wife. And then I joined Rick Springfield's band. Also, the Bon Jovi thing happened then, too. So I had a lot of activity at age 23. At age 23, I joined Rick Springfield's band. He was the biggest star in America. That's not a, an exaggeration. He had just had Jesse's Girl. He also had a number one TV show. So he was a pop star. So there was some credibility. You know, people didn't, some people didn't think he was the most credible person. But I knew just from knowing him, he actually, if you, if you ever saw Rick live, it was like seeing the who he was full out rock power chord, yeah. you know, and he's still, yeah. that way. he still go, goes out there and is basically puts, puts a rock show on like the Foo Fighters or the, the who, in fact, the Foo Fighters had him in their movie and had him on stage a few years ago. So he's actually That's kind cool. of come back to having more credibility. Anyway, I spent four years with Rick. We did five records. Uh, I was able to, to, you know, tour the world and play guitar solos on pop records and and kind of get a little better at the craft. And then in the late 80s, that ended, I started doing publishing demos. Out of that came, you know, Crowded House and some other stuff. And that's when I really developed my skill as a person. Because being a studio guitar player, if you don't understand what it is, it's very easy, as it was for me, to sit in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and hear a Steve Lukather part on a Toto song and go, Oh, I can play that. It's mm -hmm. not what it is. It's mm. walking into a strange situation, having a myriad of sounds, being able to switch parts, come up with parts instantly. You know that. I didn't know that then. So I was able to learn that craft in the late 80s by putting, you know, getting right in, into the fire with these songwriters and, and having to come up with parts constantly that were not the parts I wanted or maybe that I heard, but that, you know, Make it sound like NXS. Make it sound like U2. Make it sound like whoever. You had to deliver these parts instantly. There's no 30-second lag time between. You have to do it instantly. And so I got better at it. And the we can talk about this, too. But the 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 a funny thing happened at 25. Dan Huff moved here from Nashville. I think I was 25. And he took over the whole scene because he was so talented and so motivated and so good at what he did. Mm. And everybody else kind of... <laughs> went a notch down. Now, Michael Landau was not as interested as do in doing sessions. He was always interested in being an artist, so he didn't mind doing less sessions. Lukather was in Toto, so he didn't mind. But there was a thing where Dan Huff displaced a list of people because he mm. went straight to the top when he came here. And then when he moved back to Nashville, we all advanced back up again. And that's when <laughs> that's when I started working every day. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? That it is that small yeah. of a rarefied group of people, and I got better as I was as I went. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me that Dan moved back to Nashville. And then there was a time, you know, I, I got to meet Tom Buku back, and he was flirting with the idea of moving here. And it was like, I, you know, stay where you are. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love the pause. Um, well, I'll just say you just stay there. Yeah, yeah. Dan, uh, when I asked him about when he moved, he was like, "I remember the gas station that had the payphone that I'd run down and you know take phone calls on." What were the first like couple weeks, couple months, year like in LA for you? What was uh, like, how did you get started? Cause I, 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 that's been my, the fun thing for me to hear about is people arrive in LA and they arrive cause they knew one person or one person says, Hey, come out. John McCurry told me the story of how he left New York to come out 
And then he's like, I feel like I got more jobs in L.A. when I was in New York. And it was just, you know, and there's there's always this. What was that? What were the first couple of years like? And then how did how did you go from living in Los Angeles to being with Rick Springfield and doing albums and being on tour? What what was that process like? And was it a phone call? Was it I happened to be in the right room? And talk about that. So when I moved here, um, it was really, really easy in a way because, oh, I, I remember I had one guy that I knew through a couple of roadies who were with, the, with a band called The Babies. I ended up doing a John Waite record, but I knew a couple of the guys who worked with The Babies. Um, mm. with, and, and Jonathan Cain was in The Babies. He joined Journey and then John Waite did a solo thing that, and I was part of that. But there was a, a, another guitar player that they introduced me to who was leaving a gig and he needed the best way to live, leave a gig politically is to install somebody really good in your place. So you don't leave people high and dry. So he installed me in a, in a band called Shandy and Shandy was about to do her first record. She had a big record deal. So that was one way, but literally the way it worked is you would meet one musician. They would introduce you to the next three musicians. And then those three would introduce you to three to five. So it's like a tree. Mm. You'd meet one, then you had five and then you had 25 and then you had a hundred and then you had it, it. If you were, you know, easy to work with and good and you showed up on time and tried hard, it would just open like that because you were constantly meeting new people in every situation. And the Rick Springfield thing happened again because I had a friend who snuck me in on an overdub session for his producer. And Rick was just, so this is luck and timing and being in the right place at the right time. R Rick was, he had the number one hit and he wanted a new band. He kept his drummer, but he wanted to replace everybody else. Mm. And I knew exactly what to do. I came in with a pair of 100 watt marshals. And when I played, I played loud and like Pete Townsend and I played solos that were loud and big. I knew what to do. So, uh, so I'd already played on the record. He got a good feeling from me. I got hired. It's different for everybody. The thing that happened to Dan Huff, and you can he may have said this to you, he had a couple of advocates, but his main advocate was Robbie Buchanan. And mm. Robbie is an amazing musician. He's now retired in Canada. I worked with Robbie a lot, you know. Um, Robbie w worked with Dan, and R Robbie knew that he had what it took to be the bulletproof studio music. He already was formed. He had everything in place. So there were a couple of other advocates, but all it takes is one, somebody at Robbie Buchanan's level to say, this is the guy to come on in and, and, and join Lukather and Landau and, and everybody. Mm. Wow. I just think it's, yeah, it, I, I, one of the things I wanted to talk about too, that you and I have, have chatted about a little bit is just this ecosystem on a number of levels. But one of the, parts of the ecosystem that I think is fascinating that you were saying is when it talks about having somebody who would advocate for you or vouch for you, part of it. And Dan did bring this up. You and I talked about it. Um, some others have brought it up was just the jam sessions that were happening when the record button wasn't on and what that led to and the relationship building that you did with a drummer or a bassist or another guitar player. Could you just talk about, because I feel like that's not on a record and it's not something maybe that a lot of people know about, but man, to be a fly on the wall, you know what I mean? It's like to be in the locker room, essentially with the sports team, they're not out there on the court, but they're not out there on the field, but they're there talking. Could you just talk about the ecosystem of just it being kind of one big family and Hey, we're all going to jam together and who's this. And I like the way your sound and I'll vouch for you on that. And that, that to me, I think you and I spoke about that. I just think that is one of the most under talked about coolest parts of, of the session scene at that time. Well, probably the best example of that is that in the nineties, uh, I would show up super early because I had a rig that was constantly being, I was constantly building my rig and trying to make it better. Now, someone mm -hmm. like Michael Landau, he, he had a bulletproof rig. He was really smart about having a simple bulletproof, amazing rig 
100% of the time. Um, and it took me a very long time to get to that point. And I never really got it because I was always changing stuff out. And so I, there's a point to this. I would show up super early for, let's say, a, a noon session. I would show up at 9 a.m. I'd get in my car and drive, which there's traffic in L.A. I'd show up at 9.30 with the cartridge guys so that everything was placed perfectly. I could sit in the right place and, and near the drummer where I could see the control room. There's a lot of factors that I really wanted to be exactly right when I did session work. Um, and so I'd be there at 9.30. Well, Jeff Percaro wanted to be there early, too, because he lived in Hidden Hills, and he wanted to never worry about the traffic. So there were a lot of days when I would show up and it would just be me and Jeff Percaro in the room. And he'd start to play and I'd start to play and we would jam. And he would start to recommend me for stuff. And then when he did his first record production, this official, official record production, which was Boss Gags, he asked me to play guitar in it. And I, I was kind of heartbroken because I was on a tour with Al Jarreau at that moment. Oh man, that was one of the factors where that led me to never tour again after that because you have a couple of those heartbreaking moments where you can't be on a session because you're in a hotel room in New Orleans or whatever, and you go, "Wait a second, it's worth it just to stay home and and see what happens." So that's another story, though. But that's probably the best example. Um, and then uh, you know all the times when you would you'd be between takes or you'd show up there before the session. And all of a sudden you're playing a groove with Benny Caliuta, you know, and it's, it's just, it's, you pinch yourself, you know, the, the, probably the other best example of that is they showed up for a Phil Collins session and I walked in and Phil was tuning his drums. And so he's hitting the toms and it's basically the Phil from in the air tonight. Doom, 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 doom. <laughs> and, and it's, it's that sound. It's wow. that exact sound. And then oh. you start tracking and you're, you're, you're tracking with Phil Collins. It's, it's, um, yeah. So just being in the room with people, that's probably the thing that is, you know, it happens in Nashville a lot and it happens a little bit here, but that's probably the thing that, that, uh, was extraordinary about, about that time. Uh, that's different now is that people often work, you know, on their own. Steve Lukather said to Rick Beato, you know, hey, and he said this before, but he said, you know, hey, anyone can do the solo thing, but it's that rhythm part that ties everything together. And one of the things that I can't do that you can do, and one of the reasons I watch you consistently is that my rhythm work can always use more work <laughs> uh, to not overuse the word work. I think what you've done, I think you said it once, and it's really, I just said it to somebody today, we were talking music. I said, this era of session guitarists were not just playing parts. They were orchestrating. They were fitting things together. They were helping write the songs, which is a number one reason why I started this channel is because I don't, I think sometimes the word session musician gets thrown around as if I come in and I play a part that was written for me and walk out and you and I both know that's not true. In fact, it's even more so the orchestration part of helping make these songs what they are. I, there's Crowded House. There's Black and White by Michael Jackson. There is all the work you do with Rick Springfield. There is Phil Collins. I can go on and on. Is there, is there, I, sometimes I feel like when I ask this question, sometimes I, I expect something different and somebody's like, oh, it was actually not what you think. It was this. Is there a particular record that you're most proud of? Not necessarily a solo, but I mean, where you're just you, goo goo dolls. I mean, I can yeah. go on. Your your list is long. That's is the there one. one that you? Yeah, yeah. That, that's the one. It's Iris by the Goo Goo Dolls because if you listen to that today, it still kind of transports you. It doesn't. There's nothing about it that identifies it with a particular time or anything. And it, and when it came out for 18 months, it was the most played song in the United States. And uh, so, as far as a song that that stands the test of time it's that that you know don't dream it's over is another one mm -hmm. so probably those two there are a lot of people that are enamored with a band i was in called toy matinee and i did a documentary on that on my channel it was a bunch of muses patrick leonard and a bunch of other people and that that's another one that if people haven't heard it you know it's worth checking I out i love that work too, yeah by so the way. I just so, have to say, so those would it. be really the ones but you know, oddly, since I started the YouTube channel and the teaching business, now that I get to reach people directly, I uh, 
I feel like, because I was thinking about the question, is there something you've done that people don't know about that you'd like to them to know about? Yeah. It happens yeah. to me all the time. I did a video last week where I featured a Shabbat telecaster. And mm-hmm. at the end of that video, I show a song that I did for Norm Harris from Norm's Guitars. I produced a song for him because he's a friend. And he had yeah. this cool song called Temptation. And I played a solo on that song that is, to me, as good as anything I've ever done. And I did it last week. And it's it's just the reach is different. It's like, so if 90,000 people saw that video, I got a lot of comments on on how much they liked it. Um, Norm showed it on his channel and about 10,000 people saw it because people on his channel are looking at guitars more than, you know, his art, his, his you know, <laughs> artist career. But what the point I'm trying to make is I, I feel like I get to reach people directly these days with playing that I'm even more proud of than what I did back in the day. Now, back in the day, I got to work with my heroes. So in these days, I just work you know, with my friends and I reach the audience directly. So the the r- miraculous thing for me is that even though my chops are probably not as fast as they could be, the choices I make are better uh, in general. You know, I'm better at this now. It's just the audience has to hear it on YouTube and find it on YouTube. They're not going to find it in the record store or on the radio. Well, I think what you're doing for people and inspiring people to play is, um, it's amazing. And, uh, uh, you have a huge fan on the other end of the, uh, microphone here. Well, Could, speaking of those heroes, what was, and I, I don't want to ask this question of like, what was it like sitting next to Mike Landau? Oh, do, but, do, do, but, 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 <laughs> but, but I, I'll ask it in the way that I asked, I kind of, I mean, I asked this to Dan, I asked this to John McCurry other people that sat in session work about sitting next to other guitarists and not even necessarily just other guitarists, but drummers too, and bassists and p- keys players, etc. But I guess I'll ask it two parts. A, what was it like? But B, as Dan said, he's like, they're paying me good money and I'm over here watching Mike Landau. I'm copping a lick or two off him. I, I always say, if you're around another professional and you're a professional, you guys learn off of each other. What was it? What was that like? And then what maybe did you grab? Because... I grab stuff from you and guitarists all the time. I'm the biggest thief there is, you know? Every time I would work with one of these guys, uh, it changed my life. And so Mm. I'll start, I have a short list and I'll start with Steve Lukather. I did a rehearsal with Steve Lukather right after I moved here because I made friends with David Garfield who had a band called Charisma and they were buddies. This prog was kind of jazz rock band and, and Dave had record deals and he was doing a record and he added me to the roster. So we had a rehearsal with Steve Lukather. And Steve walked into the rehearsal room. It's called Leeds, legendary, legendary rehearsal room. He walked in, he sat down at a nine foot grand piano and played the fastest piano riff I had ever heard. Just to show everybody in the room, his thing back then was bravado. It was, I heard it, Bill Champlin described it as that. He just... And then he, when he picked up his guitar, everything had been brought by Cartage, and it was a, a shuffle that had a, a guitar melody. He looked at the chart, and he read the melody, and he learned it very quickly. So these are moments of recognition. Later yeah. on, I heard some of the demos he made as a teenager. He would make demos and play drums, bass, piano, sing, everything as a teenager. But that's, you know, I learned that later. He wrote turn your love around on piano for george benson one you know one of the biggest song you know yeah. wrote it on piano you know just sp- spontaneously so wow you you go you go okay this is i'm only seeing the tip of the iceberg when i hear his work so he, david put the chart in front of him i saw him kind of go go okay here's how it goes he learned the melody he played it with confidence immediately and led the charge on this song and it had a little bit of delay the perfect sound ease confidence bravado authority authority is what all these people have they have authority when they play all of them and then i did a session with steve uh, a little later on where we were side by side and at a certain point he busted into larry carlton and he just effortlessly became larry carlton playing jazz wow and i went oh that too you can do that too so it really is the tip of the iceberg. 
And then if we move a little further and we go to Dan Huff, the thing about Dan is that he, his heroes were Lukather, you know, self-admitted were Lukather and Paul Jackson Jr., which pretty much covers all you need to know if you're going to show up and play, you know, pop or rock or anything in the 80s and 90s. So his ability to, and with a really soft, perfect, t- I mean, when when Mutt Lang talked about Dan Huff's touch, this can't be uh, overestimated, underestimated. It can't be stressed hard enough. If you listen to Dan Huff, the way he touches, the way he plays power chords, eighth note power chords, mm-hmm. there's a bloom that happens, right? And it's this touch, which for recording is gold. It's just gold. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I would watch Dan extrapolate and come up with the most inventive R&B clean part in the world literally within seconds. You, you could see him begin to play it and then he would look at the chord chart and then it would get a little more complicated and a little more inventive, a little more unique. And within 45 seconds, uh, within 90 seconds, there was something coming out that was unique musical you know Mm. and so then then you go okay so they do that these guys but then they do it again in two minutes with with a, a heavier part then they do it again then that song's done they do it again they do it again that's the other thing people don't talk about the stamina like i would watch michael thompson do really great guitar parts for six hours and they put up another song and he would dive in and do it for three more hours. I mean, it's, it's, mm. I mean, Bukovac talks about that, the Iron Man thing about being in the studio. People don't realize that you give one song, everything you've got, and then they give you another one and you've got to give that everything you've got. And you've got to be just as inventive and just as creative. And so these guys, you only see the tip of the iceberg when you see them work. Now, Mike Landau, he got me on a Faith Hill song. Um, we became friends. I I did an interview and I I said something that he really identified with, and yeah. and after that we we became friends. And so he got me in a Faith Hill record, and he had the simplest rig. And I remember this. This is a Nashville thing. We, we were doing a song, and Byron Gallimore, her producer said, well, let's just try it in every key. Hmm. So that's 12 keys that yeah. either you use a capo or you change your fingering or you change your inversions. Yeah. We ran down, not the whole song, but probably the first minute and a half of the song in every key, all 12 keys. And he, Michael did not falter. Every single key was the take from you know just and I, I you know i began to falter after you know we were in a flat and then d flat and then e flat and then e and then f sharp you know, whatever you know at a certain point i'm going where am i <laughs> <laughs> i don't blame you <laughs> so that's the kind of stamina i'm talking about these guys it's just it, it's they're they're just heavyweight you know world champions and then then there's a couple of others, but I'll move to Bukovac. I got to do a Rob Thomas record with Bukovac in the early 2000s. No, no, no. Maybe it was around 2010. And Matt Zerletic hired both of us. And I watched Tom during the tracking date play the ultimate part. Like, you go to the bridge and he would create the ultimate Beatles part for the bridge. And then mm. go to the outro, outro and suddenly he would be Daniel Lanois on the outro. And then he would be, you know, uh, Brian Setzer. I mean, he could do anything. Then he would do an acoustic part. And not only would he play the acoustic part, but the overtones that were just coming off of his hands while he played acoustic were stuff that I'd never heard before. So I thought at that moment, let's say this was 2010 when I did that Rob Thomas record. I'm not sure exactly when it was. I thought, before I met Tom Bukovac, that Dan Huff was the greatest studio guitar player I'd ever seen. And then at that moment, I, th- I thought, no, it's, it's Tom. And, mm. you know, Dan has hired Tom hundreds of times. 
you know, they're good friends. Yeah, Isn't it funny? So, <laughs> now, one other thing I'll tell you that was absolutely amazing was there was a point when Rascal Flatts came out here to do a record and mm. it was to try and get them to focus, you know, they rented a house in Santa Barbara and we went to Santa Barbara sound and did a record. I got hired to play guitar and Dan was the mm. producer. And so we spent mm. a week in Santa Barbara and uh, at the beginning of the session, Dan said, you know, some guys, you know, when I'm producing, they kind of freeze up a little bit. And I started laughing and I went, ain't gonna happen. Don't worry about it. Uh, I did my best, you know. And he, yeah. I remember Dan saying to me over the over the talk, he said, you know, you could just, if you just switched your style just, a, you know, 5%, you could come to Nashville and, and work all the time. Very nice thing to say. And I mm. said, no, nah, it's cool. I like California. I'm set here. I'm, I'm doing okay. And that was a nice thing. I still wasn't as good as Dan, but I did good. I did good. But the cool thing about that week, and Robbie Buchanan was, he had Robbie Buchanan to come play on it too. So I wow, to come out. that's cool. cool. So we were with Rascal Flats for a week. Because Dan was on the road, he couldn't go home at night. So we all at the hotel had dinner together every single night. So think about that. It was just, you know, having dinner, mm. talking about, you know, everything under the sun, guitar, music wise with Dan. That was, that was the, that was the greatest thing. Cause you know, if he had been home, he would have gone home to his family every night, but we sure. got to have a long dinner every night and, and just talk about everything. It was a wonderful experience. So yeah, these guys, I have, have been incredibly lucky. And then like Ray Parker Jr. I got to work with him a lot. So many people, another guy that doesn't get a lot of, of credit for studio is Rusty Anderson, because he joined Paul McCartney's band. Brilliant mm. studio guitar player. Brilliant. Mm. Mm. Um, Lots of great people out here in L.A. And and then you've got, you know, this it's all, you know, pretty much centered in Nashville now. Uh, the guy that I want you to interview that's out here, that's my friend that I hand my work to because I just don't I don't have time anymore. Yeah. Uh, is Andrew Sinewick. He is that guy here. He's an absolute genius at coming with parts and sounds instantly, immediately. He does his own solo records, too. So I'll put you guys together. He's That'd the L.A. Awesome, huh? He's the new Dan Huff in L.A. <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, and I think I, I, I'm trying to remember, I don't want to screw this up. I, there were some other people that I've covered so far too, that a lot, you know, it's not a Tim Pierce and it's not, but, but they were important like Bob Mann. Um, oh, so, oh yeah. And, and James Harrow and I used to sit next to each other and do lots of jingles. There, there were, there are lots of people. I'm just, yeah, I'm yeah. just kind yeah. of, uh, uh, you know, talking about the superstars that I yeah. couldn't believe I was in the room with. I find it so fun. It's, it's fun for me to surface the names and, and I, you know, I don't know how much not to get us off track, but it's been fun for me is, um, and I'm going to forget his name. I'll, I'll remember here in a second, but I was doing a, uh, Mariah Carey solo and I tabbed it up and I put it up and in the comments, I don't know how you probably get this, I'm talking to a man with half a million YouTube subscribers. I'm thrilled about approaching 3000. Um, but uh, it was so cool because every now and then I'll get a comment and you can tell right away whether it's legitimate or not in terms of somebody who says they were there. And this particular solo was done by somebody who was not the session guitarist necessarily. They were an engineer who also did guitar work and apparently very famously so. And he's since passed. But the guy who left the comment that was neat was you could tell he was there because he said in a very direct manner, his username didn't give me any hints as to who he was, but he said, yeah, we walked in and said, hey, blank, could you throw just a filler solo on that so we have a placeholder and then we'll come back to it, sat down, did it, and they go, nope, that's it. That's the one that'll work. And for me to get those stories organically out of the blue is what I really love about YouTube. Uh, one of the many things that I love about the connectivity of it. And I think there's cool stories like that that a lot of people don't know, you know, and they, they hear a polished record and they don't know, was that a hundred takes? Was it one take? Who was it? Was it supposed to be somebody else? Did it? Did they write that part? Like, how did that? And that's what I want to ask you. And I was reading Richard Marx's book about the whole thing about sneaking Mike Landau in to do the Vixen song and polish that up. And then he had to explain to him I had somebody come in. How often did that happen where we had a band and we needed to kind of get somebody in the room maybe to clean it up or you know i don't want to hurt any feelings here but we need a drummer or we need somebody 
or were you asked at times to come in and, and clean stuff up for a band? It happened mostly with drummers because the, mm. the drum session had to, it had to be a big win no matter what. And there were just certain drummers that you could trust to get it immediately. And sometimes the band drummer would be a l just a little, it would be, would drift a little. And now that's when there was an obsession there, you know, there was no pro tools. You couldn't fix anything. So a lot of this yeah. skill came from the fact that you couldn't fix anything. So the, the people, drummers had to deliver immediately. So there were a lot of ghost drum sessions. I didn't do that many ghost sessions, more often than not, I, if if there was a band, the guitar player in the band was good enough by the time I got busy. So if you figure I started getting busy in 1990 and working every day, I was go-to for artists, single artists. So Peter Cetera, whatever, Seal, Tina Turner. I was on mm -hmm. that list because they needed everybody. They needed a guitar player. But a band generally had a great guitar player in the band. The only exception to that is there was a point with a band called Shinedown that I love. I love this band, Shinedown, where they Same, were yeah. they were between guitar players, and I got to do all the guitars on a record called Sound of Madness, and then the next record, most of the guitars called Amaryllis, and that was just just out of kindness and respect. I didn't want to be known because they were a band. They needed to keep their band image. They're friends of mine, and I had no intention of messing with that. I, I love mm. them. They're great. Mm. I happily. So it's it's so much time. Has, for years, I didn't even talk about it. But so much time has passed. That it doesn't matter. It's just that was, you know, if you listen, I'm very proud of those records. They're as you should be, Tim. And Brent That's is one of the best. I love, by the way, I just love Shinedown. I just have to tell you. <laughs> They're that. great. So, yes. And as so much time has passed that there's really no harm in talking about it now. But <clears throat> That's probably the biggest example for me of be an uncredited thing. I think it happened a lot with bass players and drummers. You know, they would the the they would send the bass player home, and then somebody would come in in the night and replace it, and they wouldn't even tell him. You know, this this happened a lot yeah. in that realm. Yeah. But with guitar, by the time I got busy, the the bands that had guitar players, generally the guitar player could get it done, and Think about this. The tracking session had to get done when it had to get done, but they could work on the guitars for hours or days afterwards. You, know, you had to get that drum session done quick. So the drummers mm. were the ones that got replaced more often than not. One of the things I want to bring up <clears throat> that uh, one of my all-time favorite videos you have ever done, along with the modes that matter, that I've told you several times. <laughs> but uh, Tim's like, if you say it one more time, John, I'm going to hang up. Um, but... I, one of my favorite guests you've had on multiple, many times is Dean Parks. Um, but what you guys did at the Grammys the night before and that you want to talk about Iron Man stuff, that camera, I've watched that video so many times of you guys, the two shot of you guys playing and going to song after song, <laughs> after song, after song, after song. I don't think. Again, we live in a world where it's like people's attention spans are slow and small and you kind of have to hit them in the face and catch their attention and shake them. And so I don't know how many people grasp, but that to me is one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life is watching you two just play and play. And it looked effortless. And I was like, wow, guitar hero moment times two here. And it, it was, so I just wanted to bring up that I think you playing on a Shinedown record and Black or White by Michael Jackson and Crowded House. And then on top of all that, having this YouTube channel, but then what you guys did at the Grammys, I was just like, I just had to make sure I mentioned that before we got off and I didn't want to forget, but I had to tell you that him being on, I love the change. Uh, it's one of my favorite Eric Clapton songs, uh, Change the World. When you two played that together, I thought that was so cool. But the Grammy thing, I was just like, I, I don't think it's getting enough like traffic. It's just so cool what you guys did. You, it's just worth being commended. So I just wanted to tell you how much that video meant to me to see, because that's the closest thing in my mind, except for the grainy videos that I can find of you guys. I found a video of you and Luke and Landau and a couple others in a studio. And I can't remember what artist it was. It was floating around on YouTube, but I used it for B-roll for one of my episodes. And I thought that was neat just to see you all 
guys working in the same room together. But I was like, that may be the closest thing I could get to watching you guys really work live. Like it was, it was like I was sitting there anyway. So I just wanted to tell you how cool that was. Well, thank you. That's the third video I've done at the Grammys. And I had to do something different because the previous one was kind of the ultimate one as far as you know, a vlog of being at the Grammys where you walk from your mm. car and you talk about the, uh, you know, and, <clears throat> and then there was a good segment on Dean in that one. Uh, but this one, I thought, how do I make this different? And I thought, well, I'll just feature Dean. And so I set up the two cameras and yeah, he is amazing. And it just goes to show you that when two guitar players get together and that's why sessions generally had two to three guitar players when it was affordable and records were made that way. And Nashville's been that way for a long time, too, because the spontaneous ideas that start being created by somebody leaving space for somebody else, you just, everything starts popping, basically. Mm -hmm. And you don't mm -hmm. even have to think about it. And mm -hmm. that is an argument for what, doing whatever you can do to get in a room with another guitar player and play music, because it's just this interplay that is would never happen if everybody was by themselves. Now, you know, people work alone these days, and that's great, too, because you really can orchestrate if you're alone and, you know, you're not in the hot seat and you, you have extra time to get things done. So there are benefits to both ways of working. That Grammy video could have done better, but I'll tell you the reality of YouTube. The Grammys actually are not the most loved institution anymore by the general mm. public. And I noticed mm. with this particular one that I even had to change the title to, if you hate the Grammys, watch this. That's <laughs> what got people to click because our Grammy award show is in the afternoon and we're a real band and there are 80 awards given. And it's, it's like a small town award show basically. <laughs> and then <laughs> the, uh, the Grammys that happens in the evening, they only give away eight awards and that's a super pop thing that people aren't exactly happy with people who are, you know, you know, not everybody of our age or not, musicians are not necessarily happy with the primetime Grammy Awards. So it was great to do that. Uh, I'm glad you I'm glad you really like it. Dean is another one you should have on your show. I mean, the stuff he has done, I mean, when I found out that he played the intro to Josie, uh, <laughs> It was like that too. <laughs> <laughs> there's so much. There's so much that happens to me on a daily basis when I'm going through because I was the kid that read liner notes. Like yeah, right. I was listening to the radio. Yeah. So I wanted to know who was that because I knew what band Jimmy Page was in, but I didn't know who yeah. played the solo on the share album. Yeah. And so. But there is a, there, I have those moments where I go, oh, they did that too? I'm 41 years old and I still say it out loud like I'm five, you know, and it's like, it's, um, well, I'm, yeah, I'm, it, I'm, it's so I'm cool. like you, I, the, my, what I do now is very similar to what you do is that I look back and I look for stuff and I find stuff and I feature stuff that I was too busy to pay attention mm. to sometimes too busy to take the time to, to learn. And I just like you, I can spend the rest of my life mining this incredible history that's, you know, the last four or five decades. It's, it's exactly the same. I, I get blown away, too. I just keep, you know, I get chills. Uh, the other one, yeah, it, I don't know if you have so checked out Louis Shelton or not, but it's a little bit before the era. That mm -hmm. one will blow your mind because what he did musically, uh, just spontaneously, and then he produced Seals and Crofts, which is some of the most beautiful guitar colors, yes. editing, solos, riffs. That I mean, it's just masterful. I got to hear this because I asked RJ this and Leon Todd and everybody else, and you've got half a million subscribers. When, when did you decide, hey, I'm going to do this YouTube thing? Because I was going back. This was actually not recently. I think it was like six or seven months ago. I was like, Speaking of mining great information, I'm going to go back to the beginning and some of these channels I want to watch from the beginning. And so when I'd sit down in my chair at night for the 45 minutes of peace I get and I'm watching through my YouTube stuff and I'm checking out if Tim uploaded anything today, one of the times I was like, you know what? I'm going back to the beginning. I just want to see what the first videos were and try to work my way through them. I did that with Dan Earlywine, the Luthier with Stu Mac. Like what oh, was the first amazing. video? He's amazing. What, what, when did Dan start? And so I grabbed some tips that were 
10, 11, 12 years old that, you know, maybe not be at the top of the of the algorithm these days. But I, I thought it was so cool what you were doing and watching your cockpit, so to speak, here grow. And what when when did you make that call and say, I think I'm going to do YouTube? Well, this is good. And I mentioned this to you in our last conversation. I'm glad we had that talk because I can focus on this and I've been thinking about it. So I built this for overdubs, you know, in our mm. era, the keyboard players like Robbie Buchanan, Robbie Buchanan had the most fabulous recording studio in the world in his home with a, a white API and his three racks behind him. The keyboard players all had amazing home setups. And then at a certain point, <coughs> As guitar players, we were able to create home setups too. Michael Thompson did it. Landau never did it. A lot of people here did it. So I created this to do overdubs quickly for people. And it's designed so I can run Pro Tools. The client or producer or engineer can run Pro Tools. I can shave off five and 10 seconds with every move we make and just really create flow and momentum and communicate looking them straight in the eye read the room constantly because I can tell if they're bored, if they're happy, if they're sad because I can see them straight across there because we have mirrored Pro Tools stations. If, if a Pro Tools move is quicker for me to do rather than explain to the engineer, I can do it myself. It just allowed for absolute momentum. So that's why this exists. Now to your mm. question. Okay, so I started working in the 80s. I worked constantly for decades, okay? In the late, let's say around 2009, 2010, I realized, okay, things are changing. Budgets are not as big. As a studio musician, you are going to age out at a certain point anyway. I don't know if you're aware of the Tommy Tedesco quote. It goes like this. Who is Tommy Tedesco? Get me Tommy Tedesco. Tommy t <laughs> Get me a young Tommy Tedesco who is Tommy Tedesco? That is the life of a session player, okay? And I've always been very hyper-realistic. Like, I was that person that when I finished a job, I thought I'd never get hired again. Never trusted the music business. That's why I always kept my demo clients and my, my clients in the middle because every time I would do, like, I did a Bruce Springsteen record that was, you know, incredibly wonderful and high profile. And the next day, I was at a friend's house doing his song demo in his bedroom. I kept everybody mm. as a client because I never really trusted the top end of the music business. That actually mm. saved me. It, it, it created an extra decade of work for me because as the record big, business began to change, I still had this giant independent clientele. So Interesting. That, that extended yeah. things for me. But I was sitting here in uh, around 2010 going, okay, so how do I want this to play out? And I discovered Marty Schwartz and Scott Devine, who's Scott's bass lessons, and there was a drummer named Mike Johnson. And Greg Bissonette said, hey, this guy, Mike Johnson, has got all these students, and he has this great business teaching. And then Marty, I met Marty Schwartz, and I thought, oh, if I can even just get a little bit of this teaching thing going online, I can stay off the streets. As my mm. session career mm. really... You know, if you go, if you watch the Wrecking Crew movie, one of the musicians says, what you want, I forget which one it was, which musician, I can almost think of who it was, said, what you want is the softest landing for your career as possible, okay? And it's going to happen. I mean, I started at age 20. I was sitting here at age 50 going, okay, how do I want this to play out? So I started, and it was cringeworthy, getting on YouTube and trying to... to Go, hey, here I am. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I did it. And, and, and even Marty said, you know, you're going to feel embarrassed. <laughs> but keep going. <laughs> so I built an email list. I made a digital product. It sold. And I thought, okay, this is going to work. And so here I am. I have four employees. I have uh, 6,000 paying members. I have 70,000 guitar players on my email list. I have 50, you know, 500,000 subscribers on YouTube. I just... Like anything in else in life, if you just apply yourself and do it every day, even badly, it begins mm. to take shape and begins to form into something. I hope that answers your question. If it, you know, no, that is so cool, Tim. Because I, 
I, I always say I it's it's awesome to talk about the success stories once you've gotten there, but I think it's so beneficial for people to hear about well, how did this begin and what were you thinking here and like you said the cringeworthy parts and you know the, I always say there's we're all going through similar things they just have a different particular shade of black and white and gray and different colors and and it's and the, even if somebody can take a piece from that I just think that's so cool to hear about well I'm gonna try this and I and I'm gonna see how this works and. I was just telling somebody today, my favorite quote of all time is, you know, you have to make bad barbecue to make good barbecue, you know, and it's, yeah. <laughs> it's the like, first idea, even when I do a YouTube video, I'll spend two days on the first idea and then somehow it'll lead me to the next idea, which is a lot better. I throw away that two days and I start again. Happens to me yeah. all the time. All the it's time. It's so cool. It's so cool. And, and I think yeah. what, what, I, what I don't know... And again, I, I don't know if I'll ever – a few folks I don't know if I'll ever interview, but I've, I've said it to you now, and I'll, I've said it to Dan and John, and I, I think I might fly over my house before Michael Landau agrees to an interview. But, um, you know, but I will say what I think is so neat about what you're doing on YouTube and what YouTube has given as a platform is I hear from people all over the world every day. Like somebody – and a lot of what my channel started on was doing tabs. Because as a kid growing up in an era where the only time I could get a tab in the early 90s was if you subscribed to a guitar magazine. Those came once a month, and that was all you got. And then the internet didn't exist. And so I said, if I could do this and put these accurately up in the right key, in the right beats per minute, accurate music notation, um, and make sure that they are correct, at least as close as I possibly can without being the guy who played it, then I think I'm going to give that away for free. Not because I didn't want to make money on it, but I was like, this, I want this to be the foundation of what I'm doing because I music's given me so much. How do I give back? But what I, what has blown me away is I thought I'd hear from a few people, but that I hear from so many people and I see your comments in your live stream and I see what Marty Schwartz and Leon Todd and RJ. And I mean, I can go on and on and on. What I think is so cool is how many people go, I picked up the guitar and this unlocked something for me because all of us hit a plateau as guitar players. It's like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get out of this. And there was so much noise on the internet for so long. I thought, let's just get this back to square one. And that is learn a song. And what I love about your live streams is, is those songs that you've talked about every time I hear them now, I think of your video and your walkthrough and I see the comments in your live stream of people going, Oh, like reeling in the years. I swear to you, I can't hear reeling in the years without thinking about your video. And I, every time I hear it, especially the intro <clears throat> and um, it's inspiring so many musicians to pick up the guitar, but it's also unlocking these songs. Cause I forget all the time I was playing for my daughter's show choir they needed someone to play the hit me with your best shot, Neil Giraldo solo. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So eight times a spring, I sat and I played the hit me with your best shot solo in the middle of this show choir thing. And I tell you this story because I had somebody come up to me and go, I'm not kidding you here in Omaha, Nebraska, go, man, that is so cool. And how'd you get that tone? And that's really cool. You're playing with the kids. You know, I was watching Tim Pierce. Do you know what Tim Pierce says the other day? And he goes into this thing. And here's a dad in his garage in Omaha, Nebraska, that's picking up the guitar again because of something that you were doing or hearing this at a, you know, and then the doubly cool thing is right after this, and I'll finish this story here. Sorry to be long winded was a kid who was probably 19 years old goes, what is that pointed down to the Floyd Rose? What What is that? I mean, because there's no perception. They're, they're, this is not something they see all the time. Kids aren't walking into music stores. Like, it's just not, it's not the same. And fascinated. And I thought, here, 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 right here, just now, I reach two completely gif different generations. And you're doing that on a daily, hourly. I mean, YouTube's great. It's encyclopedia. People look it up all day long. They're just churning through your stuff. And... Anyway, I just wanted to share that with you because I think the connectivity of YouTube is inspiring so many guitarists and what you do with your lessons removes the gimmicky noise of you have to know every mode to be good at this instrument. So you better get down and learn it. And I've had more kids come to me and tell me it's like, it, I, I forget it. It just seems too complicated. They saw some YouTube video where somebody really tried to berate them with 
not an easy touch. And hey, you can do this. And let's start a piece at a time and just learn a song. And I, I just, I, I, I thought what you're doing and the way you teach lessons is is the opposite of that in such a positive way. Well, so. thank you. I mean, I, I actually had a very good career making simple parts simpler and simpler in the moment for the artists I was working for. So my message, and it's the same as yours, the thing about songs, we are ensemble players as guitar players and songs. And th that mm. to me was always the most pleasurable idea to be, to be coming up with parts and sounds that, you know, within an ensemble with bass, drums, keyboards, and vocal. And a lot of what you see today, and it ha has to do with survival in some ways, the, the guitar careers that are available today are virtuoso careers. And so mm. the high wire act, you go out and, you know, you are the best in the world, among the best in the world. You play as fast as you can and you get endorsements and you get gigs and you go play concerts. We didn't have to do that because we were playing song. And so that, mm. th that in a way, I understand why there's so many people chasing that it, it's a legitimate it's an amazing guitar career you know laurie basillo is probably my favorite virtuoso guitar player because she's so musical i like mateo mancuso he's amazing and that that thing he does with his right hand is like nothing ever in history and then you take somebody like Corey wong who actually does it with music he just plays rhythm mm -hmm. guitar with singers oh, in a huge Corey band wong. so there's lots of ways to do it he's more akin to what we like which is he's he found a way to do it while making songs and making music with singers and with horn players and ensemble playing. So what I what I try and stress to people is this. So with regards to theory, there is a finite amount of theory you need to know in order to play the music you love. Like if you want to play pop, rock, R&B, soul, country, you only have to learn a certain amount of this theory and you're good. And that should be very reassuring to people. It's not endless. It's not endless. It's the number system. It's basically the nat natural number system, the mode system, triads. You know, you find your way around. But at every point in this process, it can be fun and pleasurable. And you don't have to feel bad about your limitations. The amazing thing about guitar is limitations become character. Keith Richards has limitations, but he's one of the greatest guitarists in the world because he does his thing around those limitations. Violin is not like that. I dare say piano is not like that either, but electric guitar in particular, you can be still forming what you do and it becomes out as character. You can put your message across. So I try and stress to people that they should really enjoy whatever the level they're at. Mm. And just seek that. a little more if they want. But you don't have to be one of these superstars. You know, I encourage people to go play with their friends on the weekend, find the musical life that they they like, but do it as an ensemble player and play songs, and you'll be satisfied. Tim, I I uh, this has been one of the best interviews I think I've ever, ever done in my life. I I've just enjoyed the heck out of this. I wish we could talk for four more hours. I have a billion other questions. We'll have to maybe do a part two. Let's do it. <laughs> I uh, I'm your man. We'll we'll do it again soon, and uh, I'll try and spread spread the word about you to a couple of friends of mine and see if we can get them. Uh, you know, people are gettable, but Mike Landau. You know, it's funny. Pete Thorne and I tried to get Mike to join us on the Pete and Tim show many years mm -hmm. ago. And others have, have grabbed a mic, and I think I saw him do a Fender interview recently or something. Somebody got it. Did on his yeah, yeah, he did on his Coma guitar, and it sounded like he was reading a, a monologue of how that guitar came to be, which is, of course, the one Jim Tyler modified for him, and that was neat. I thought that was a really neat video. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I, I showed, up, showed up at Norik Renson's uh, a few weeks ago, and, and Michael Landau showed up at the same time. We had the most wonderful conversation. He is the nicest, sweetest, most gentle person he just you know he he's happy he was it's it's amazing he turned down a tour with right now he turned down a tour with james taylor to australia because he had like five gigs uh with eric johnson that him and eric johnson together mm. and so dean mm. is filling in for him mm. uh with james taylor in australia but michael is he knows what he wants he knows who he is and he just doesn't really feel the need to talk about it and uh but i maybe you'll be the guy 
you know, maybe Cliff. I, I asked Cliff Jones and he, he said the exact same thing you did. And he said, Cliff had a funny line. You know, if I was as good as Mike, I'd have a billboard on Santa Monica Boulevard that just said, I'm the shit. <laughs> <laughs> and Cliff said, you know, but that's not who Mike is. He's the most humble, um, you know, just down to earth human being. And he said, it's amazing that a guy like that. And I think this about you. I think this about Dan. I think this about, you know, I'm going to have Luke on one of these days. Hopefully I just every here's what I, I said this to somebody. I sold a guitar to today that I built for him and big fan of yours as well. And we were talking and I said, you know, what's funny is, you know, when you meet, have you ever met your hero and you meet your hero and it's not, didn't really go how you thought it would. I said, every time I've interviewed somebody and including today, I said, every talking to Dan and John McCurry and, and you and people that have idolized your music for decades. And I said, I walked away from it going, even the ones that I haven't been able to reach yet, like Mike, Every time I hear somebody talk about you or me talking to you has been everything I thought it would be and more. And it wasn't disappointing, you know, and it wasn't I didn't have a bad experience. It's not like because I've, I've had that, you know, where I met somebody and they kind of blew me off. And I was like, wow, damn, you know, that sucks for th three decades. I really was idolizing that person. And I guess it wasn't meant to be, you know, and I move on. But it was I said, that's really cool. So I always thought even if Mike doesn't talk to me. The fact that I've talked to you and Dan and it was just such a amazing experience. It's like maybe Santa Claus is real, you know, maybe, <laughs> you know, it's like maybe, maybe Santa's not drug out the front door and beaten to a pulp. And I just, so I respect it. You know, and I, I told Cliff, I said, look, you know, if, if no one wants to talk, I'm good with that. I can respect it. If they're like, listen, I don't want to take a victory lap on session work that I did. And that's fine. Um, I, it's it's just really cool to me. What's funny is if I put you guys' name at the beginning of a YouTube video, even if it's only a 30-second part, I can see people right away. The engagement just goes up like, ooh, ooh, I'm going to learn this one. I'm going to learn this one. And it's that, to me, is the magic. Well, let me tell you one more thing about Mike. He's got an amazing sense of humor. And Michael Landau made a choice. I think one of the reasons I worked so much in the 90s, too, is that because Michael made a choice to only do the sessions he wanted to do you know mm. it it he didn't take every session and and that's smart because you can get worn down if you take every session and you put yourself in places where people are not as appreciative as they should be so he was very selective and there's a really a producer that's really really famous who was huge wrote a lot of great songs that i worked with for many years i love the guy and mike used to work for this producer and this producer said to me Hey, I heard Lando move to Ohio. And I, I, I thought for a second and I started, la I, I couldn't, I almost couldn't contain my laughter because I was getting a session. I was getting hired because his, Mike's solution, and this is sense of humor to this producer was he said, yeah, I, 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 I moved to Ohio. <laughs> That may be one of the best stories it's, I've ever. How long? How long did that that lie last? Like, did did the producer never figure out that Mike was still rolling no, around I, LA? It probably, it probably the, the recognition probably came back in a few weeks or months. You know, I mean, it, it, it uh, probably settled in at a certain point, and there were no hurt feelings. And sure, I, I think Mike did have a girlfriend in another state for a while. So, but so that may have been it. May have been the truth, but adapted for the sole purpose of just letting go of a client that he didn't want to work with. Uh, but I just, it was so hilarious. It was oh. so hilarious. Well, I still love the Mike Rich Rankin told the story about the whole, you know, the, the, the vomit finishes on the James Tyler guitars and the um, schmears and how, you know, it was really rich. They were trying to do a finish and, the not liking it. And so Rich dumped a bunch of acetone on it to, you know, strip it and start over. And Mike walked in just hanging out one day and he goes, Ooh, what's this? And then of course that's how we get to burning water and all the different. And I'm like, what a neat, I guess what a, how very guitarist okay. of that to be what it is. Okay. You know? One last story because you, uh, we can say it in part two too. So I used to play at this club called Cafe Cordial 
I had this kind of super band with John Molo from Bruce Hornsby, Jason Sheff from Chicago, and a great keeper mm. named J.T. Thompson. And one night, Michael Landau came in, okay? And so I'm in a club, which is a restaurant, and the stage is at the same level as the restaurant. So the stage is just a corner, you know. Okay, so Michael Landau comes in, and he sits down cross-legged at my feet and sits there while I'm playing, <laughs> looking up at me, cross-legged at my feet. <laughs> what did you do? How did you continue? <laughs> I just, how did I? I have no idea. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> how long did he stay in that position? Is the A other long question. time. <laughs> <laughs> It's just an incredible, oh, incredible sense of humor. Incredible. Oh, I just, I love it. <laughs> like, like <laughs> oh. Mike, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Isn't that great? Oh, that is so great. Well, my friend, I uh, when I come to LA, I will, I will, I will come see you. And uh, yeah, come, come to the studio, come to the house. You should come to Nam if you get a chance. It's it's kind of full on now again, and it's it's a super fun thing. So come on out. I yeah, I I've, I've been meaning to get out there. I I will definitely get out there soon and take you up on that, my friend. So right. thank you again for the time. It means so much. Big moment for me today. Me too, and look forward to the next one. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>